Thanks CuriosityStream for sponsoring me, and heads up everyone, you can watch this video uncensored and ad-free on Nebula, the link and details are in my description. Morning everyone, I'm Soph, these were my great grandma's notes that you can't really read. There we go. Um, and there are actually lots of ways that trauma can be passed through generations. We call this gift from our predecessors generational trauma, or intergenerational trauma, or sometimes transgenerational trauma. And one of the most established ways that it can domino along familial lines is through behaviour. Someone's stressful life experiences change their behaviour, that includes their behaviour towards their children, so those children have a stressful upbringing which alters their behaviour, and there we go. Now whilst that cycle isn't always set in motion, it makes it pretty clear how the impact of trauma can across generations. People could be taught to fear, or to placate, or to close off, either because that's what their parents do, or that's what they learn in response to what their parents do. Trauma can also be connected by community experience, with historical events or repeated treatment having an impact on a group's sense of identity. However, while psychological and sociological causes of generational trauma are really, really interesting, they're not actually what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about whether trauma can be passed through generations genetically? And the answer to that is almost definitely not. Simply, a traumatic experience won't change your genetic code. Short video. <laughs> but follow-up question, can trauma be passed through generations epigenetically? Now that is something I can get my teeth into. But first things first, I just realised my socks are in shop, so there we go sorted. Your DNA code is pretty much set in stone, bar mutations that arise as your cells multiply. And each of your cells has the same DNA in it. So a skin cell has the same DNA as a nerve cell. So how do they end up looking so different then? Well that's because the genes that get switched on or expressed in each cell type is different. And this switching on or off of genes is controlled by science word and basis of this video, epigenetics. Epigenetics literally translates to on top of genes. It's the name given to the things that control how DNA is packaged and labelled, and this then controls how it's expressed. So like chemical tags can be added to genes to switch them on, or DNA can be wrapped up really tightly to switch it off. Now my favourite example of an epigenetic change links to that second wrapping tightly thing, and it's something called histone acetylation. Sophie's fave, histone acetylation. Acetylation, acetylation. Sophie's fave. And I just love it, because it's such a physical thing to picture, and it's kind of cool when you realise just how mechanical the things are that affect how your body works. So basically, in your cells, your DNA is packed super tightly, and anyone who's packed away string, relatable, <laughs> knows that the best way to pack something long and thin away is to wrap it around something else. So, in our cells, DNA is wrapped around these things called histones. It's all well and good wrapping this DNA tightly around histones, but if it is wrapped too tightly, then our cell's machinery won't be able to read it, so those genes won't be expressed or switched on. We say that these tightly wrapped inaccessible genes are silenced, in sections of DNA called heterochromatin. Just another way that in this day and age, the heteros are silenced. Justice for straight pride. One way to unsilence a gene and switch it on is by adding an acetyl group to the histone. Now, I know you know what that does, but let me explain it for everyone else's benefit. DNA is negative and histones are positive, and that means they're attracted to each other, because as anyone who's read a YA novel knows, opposites attract. However, when an acetyl group, aka two carbons, three hydrogens, and an oxygen, are attached to a particular bit of the histone, it stops it from being positive. This means the negative DNA is suddenly a lot less attracted to it, so the DNA loosens how tightly it's packed around. This loosening and opening up of the DNA means the cell's machinery can access it, so the gene can be read. Voila! I just love how physical that is to picture. Tightly packed DNA, can't be read. Loosen it up a bit, boom, read like a book baby. And it's thanks to mechanisms like this that the genes that are switched on and off completely change cell by cell without changing your genetic code. Genius. Epigenius. Okay, personal preferences for genetic study aside, there's a reason that I'm talking about this. There's a theory that the impact of someone's traumatic experiences could be passed on to their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, etc. via epigenetic changes like histone acetylation. So let's break this down and see how likely it is. Evidence has shown that experiencing traumatic events can create epigenetic changes in our bodies, especially in genes related to stress. In particular, research has focused on something called DNA methylation. Now, I'm not going to take 
takes so long to explain it as it did with histone acetylation, but basically it's where you chuck a methyl group, aka a carbon and three hydrogens, onto a bit of DNA called a CPG island. Coincidentally, where CGP Grey goes to unwind. Haha. <laughs> this makes those genes less active and maybe more sometimes. It's Let's gloss over how complex DNA methylation actually is, okay? The point is, DNA methylation is another one of those epigenetic changes that keeps your genetic code the same whilst changing what your body does with the genes. And research suggests that traumatic events can trigger this DNA methylation and other epigenetic changes in genes related to stress. These then alter how we respond to stress moving forward. Your stress systems in your body are actually really complicated, um, so me trying to squeeze an explanation for them all into this video would set them off in me in real time. Um, but the spark notes are that epigenetic changes in stress-related genes can have all sorts of downstream effects. From increased anxiety and fear to altered metabolism, from immune system dysregulation to depression. One of the most well-known after effects of trauma is PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And sure enough, there's evidence that people with PTSD have epigenetic tags on various genes that change their activity. Yes, genes related to stress, but also genes that affect their ability to form new memories and forget old associations. This has even led to the theory that PTSD is caused in part by epigenetic changes. So, trauma seems to have an impact on epigenetic labels. The epigenetic theory of generational trauma then is that these trauma-induced labels can be passed on to a person's biological kids who will then inherit the same symptoms. Is this possible? Well, if a fetus is literally in the womb at the time of a stressful event, then said fetus could pick up epigenetic markers themselves. If that fetus also had eggs of its own already, then those eggs could pick up epigenetic markers. So that would be two future generations affected by one set of trauma. But when we look beyond mid-pregnancy stress getting directly passed on to offspring and ask if your genetic changes could generally be inherited by your future kids, which is essentially what the foundation of the epigenetic genetic generational trauma theory is, we hit a bit of a problem. When your sperm and your egg had a very close cuddle and became you, all of the DNA methylation on the genes, except in a few protected areas that don't include stress genes, was wiped. The chromosomes became a blank slate in regards to stress-related methylation. Now this seems like a bit of a death knell for the theory, and yet, and yet, it's not over until I sing. So rather than eliminate the possibility of epigenetic inheritance completely, let's continue to talk about it whilst gently holding our horses. Because the thing is, the evidence for biologically inherited trauma is there. Here's just a couple of examples. The first one is that if mice learn to associate the smell of cherry blossom with an electric shock, then their offspring have increased sensitivity to that smell. A sensitivity that gets passed down through eggs or sperm, not necessarily just during pregnancy. Although, side note, it says in loads of articles that the smell was cherry blossom, but when looking up the chemical that's actually listed in the experiment, all I could find was that it's found in apples, beef, and the scent that beavers give off to mark their territory, but still the result still stands whatever the smell actually smelt like. My second example is a human example, and it's the historical data from the American Civil War shows that the sons of prisoners of war who endured particularly harsh conditions, those sons died at younger ages than the sons of non-prisoner of war soldiers, or even the sons of prisoners of war who endured comparatively more favourable conditions. That's a pretty shocking finding, but Examples like that latter one don't have much biological backing, and so a lot of the heavy lifting biologically and epigenetically is done by studies in animals like the first one. And those are great findings, but the fact that they're in animals automatically limits them. There are more modern day human studies that have looked at epigenetic markers via blood or spit samples, but these are limited because we don't know if blood and spit represent what's going on in the brain, for example. So with the field faced with these issues, a lot of researchers who are interested in epigenetics and generational trauma think that the best way to do it is to combine animal studies, human studies, and post-mortem brain samples from humans. And they also highlight the importance of doing experiments over really long time frames. And that's a great point because epigenetics is a hugely complicated, exciting area of research, but it is quite a new one, a bebe to quote Moira Rose. And the nature of cross-generational trauma is you've got to study it across many generations, something we haven't really had the chance to do yet. And because it's such a new area, scientists also haven't really had time to unpack the many different types of epigenetic changes that exist. I've only mentioned two here, but there are absolutely tons, and maybe generational trauma is carried by a change that doesn't get wiped at conception like methylation. 
that could explain a lot. So yeah, it feels very much like a watch this space kind of field, but that's okay because a lot of people are watching the field. As this review of loads of epigenetics research says, it's become a provocative biological explanation. And that's exactly right. It is provocative. No, it's not. It's it gets gross. the people going. It, it, but why is it so provocative? What's the point in knowing that trauma could be passed on epigenetically? Why is this so exciting? Well, because it could suggest a route by which the impacts of said trauma could be treated. Remember, epigenetic markers are reversible. Harking back to the cherry blossom, beaver scent, whatever it was experiment from mice from before, mice who were oversensitive to the smell could have that reversed over time and that reversal was accompanied by a change in in epigenetic markers. Drugs that alter epigenetic markers are even being investigated. Now again, the complexity of the system means that making such drugs won't be a walk in the park, but there's some evidence that a drug called valproate, which affects the histone acetylation that I mentioned at the beginning, could reduce anxiety. There's evidence in mice and in humans who underwent trauma that if parents choose to be attentive, they can prevent anxiety-like behavior in their offspring. Now, this doesn't feel like a newsflash, parenting style affects kids, but there are some suggestions that DNA methylation or epigenetic changes have a role in mediating this. But I feel like this last example highlights a key point actually, that generational trauma is a thing. We can inherit trauma, we know that. I said so at the start. It can be passed on culturally, psychologically, societally. We don't need to know anything about epigenetics to know that's the case. And in the same vein, people with PTSD or depression or anxious attachment can find things that help them without having any idea how their DNA is labeled. Therapy, creating nurturing relationships, seeking out positive environments are just some examples of those. Epigenetics is exciting. That's why I wanted to make a video on it, don't get me wrong. And it could be a game changer, but it's not quite there yet. So behavioural and psychological roots of care are still most important. What I think matters is that we focus on taking transgenerational trauma seriously in general, offering support to people who need it. And if in the future that support has the option of involving something epigenetics related, then all the better. Now, <laughs> this is a complete gear change, which I probably should have thought about before, but there's no other way to do it, so prepare yourselves. I made a video about a guy who did a very dodgy PhD, and I can't really talk about it here on YouTube because I will get demonetized, but I wanted to tell you because you can watch it on Nebula, which is a streaming service where I post all my YouTube videos early and without any sponsor reads or ads. I also put exclusive videos on there too, like this latest one, which I'm planning on maybe making into like a Nebula exclusive series called like Soph's Paper Club where I talk about weird scientific studies and experiments that I come across. Um, name ideas appreciated to be honest. One reason that Nebula's great and the reason that I can post this video on there is because I don't have to worry about getting demonetized for things like talking about a man who but also, obviously, it's not just me being a lone wolf on Nebula. There's like a hundred other creators posting early ad-free videos too, and there's loads of other exclusive content completely unrelated to me. But if you want to check out my exclusive video, then you can sign up to Nebula via the wonderful Curiosity Stream, who we've teamed up with to give you a great deal. Now, if you don't know who Curiosity Stream are already, then one, welcome to one of my sponsor reads, you must be new here. And two, Curiosity Stream is a website where you can find thousands of documentaries like The Science of Cute or Seals, Clowns of the Sea, both examples you may want to watch to cleanse yourself after seeing the latest episode of Soph's Paper Club. Now if you go to curiositystream.com slash notes, you can access both Nebula and Curiosity Stream for a whole year for just $14.79. So that's one payment of less than $15, which translates to about £12 or not. I've got no idea what the pound's going to do. But for that payment, you get all those Curiosity Stream documentaries and all those Nebula videos for a whole year. It's an amazing deal. And also if you sign up using my link, you'll be massively helping out my channel. That's it for now though, please do like this video if you like it, share it if you share it, subscribe if you subscribe it, media my socials if you want to do that, and comment with your thoughts on the epigenetic theory of generational trauma, or just epigenetics, or just generational trauma, or whatever you fancy. Otherwise, all that's left to say is thank you so much for watching, have a lovely day, and remember, it's not over yet, because I haven't sung. <laughs> Hi patrons, thank you so much for all your support, I really appreciate it. And a big shout out to Angela, Terry, Drov and Puzlius. Imagine if I filmed the whole video like this and then <laughs> didn't realise. Morning everyone and welcome to Soph's Notes. A Negroni. Spagliato. With Prosecco in it. Ooh, stunning! <laughs> Whose stone? His stone. <laughs> it's a new pronoun. He, him, his stone. It's a way to compliment someone singing. I love his tone. Watch the power of editing. I'll make my laptop disappear. <sighs> <laughs> Bad winking is back. 
It's the end of the video officially because I'm singing over the end screen. There's some videos if you want to watch more. There's a Patreon if you want to support. Bye.